need a haircut. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start our recording, just FYI. Um, but uh, welcome to the forum on um, health and wellness in this COVID time. And I'm going to start us off with a screen share. And hopefully I can get this all to work properly. So I'm going to go to the West Lynn Lutheran Church website because I want you to see where I'm, we're lodging some of these great resources um, so that when you um, are not in the forum, you can still find what we're doing. So under, you notice there's a tab up here, Faith Formation Classes and Groups. Under Current Classes, they'll always find some stuff about what's going on right now. And our forums are right here at the top. So there's the one from last week which I did not record the whole forum last week, which I kind of wish I had, but um, there's a, the, some of the resources we referred to there. And here's our health and wellness forum. So we're gonna start with a short video from our national bishop, Bishop Elizabeth Eaton, um, on uh, caring for your mental health. And this was produced just like in the last couple of weeks from the ELCA. Let's see how this goes. My spiritual director encourages me to take an inventory. How am I physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually? Because we are created as physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual beings. Too often, we put aside any notion of taking care of our mental health, our emotional uh, stability. There's a stigma to that. But we know that it's not possible to serve and be fully ourselves and present if we are dealing with mental health issues. And during this time of the pandemic, we know that anxiety is increasing for people as well as isolation. It's critically important now as in all times for us to be aware of what's going on inside of us and to seek help. There are many resources out in the world through Portico, but also from our own church. We have a social statement on the body of Christ and mental illness. The ELCA takes this seriously, not as a defect or somehow a, 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 a failure of a person, but just to understand that our mental health, our emotional well-being is part of who we have been created to be. It's important for us to get help. It's also important for us, particularly those of us who are rostered ministers or leaders in a congregation, to be aware of how we are feeling, how we are operating, how we are engaging with others, how we can be more fully present, not just to our congregations, but to our families, to ourselves, and even to God. I urge you not to put mental health somewhere in a closet as if it's something not to be spoken about, but to understand that this is part of who we are as human beings. To make yourself um, available to services that are around and also to, to look after each other. We know when someone is having a rough time. Too often we try to bear that all by ourselves. When we are healthy, physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally, we are able to serve and bring the fullness of the good news of Jesus Christ because we ourselves are whole. It's the mental health equivalent of put on your oxygen mask before helping somebody else. You are precious in God's sight. Be well. Great, so that is our opening. And let me get out of this. Just gotta find where my, oh, there it is. All right, so uh, that is a little introduction to our theme for today. And we know we've been living in a time of crisis um, with the pandemic since March, but we've had overlapping crises um, happening as well with the uh, um, work going on in the country with the protests and the racial reckoning and the, the challenges to our uh, mental and social well being as a community. The wildfires brought another layer of that, and now we're into the election season, um, which brings another layer. Um, so we're, we're, we're 
living in this unusual circumstance. Um, I invited Stephanie to come and share something that she had shared with the um, team. We have a guideline team at church that uh, constantly uh, reads and monitors the Oregon Health Authority guidelines and the Governor Brown, uh, Governor Brown's guidelines so that we could communicate with like building partners, staff, um, anybody who you know, uh, needs to use the building, um, we can have clear decision-making around what we're doing. Um, so that's one aspect of it. But um, what Stephanie brought this last time to our meeting was much bigger and much um, more comprehensive. And so I invited her to start us off with um, that piece. So welcome Stephanie, Dr. Stephanie Broadhurst. Oh, well, thank you. Can, can you all hear me? We're, we're in Sun River and I'm happy to participate. Um, but anyway, uh, thanks to Pastor Donna for inviting me. She knows that I'm really interested in uh, COVID-19. And most recently, I've been asking myself, you know, when is this going to end? What, what does the data show? And I've done a little, little investigation, and I'm happy to share with you all um, some of my, uh, my findings. I think it's pretty clear to everybody that the virus that causes COVID-19 is here to stay. Um, it's not going anywhere. Experts in the last few months have predicted an increase in infection in the fall and winter, and we are already starting to see that. Um, many coronaviruses have a flare in uh, cooler months, so this is not, not a surprise. In any event, we're all eagerly awaiting a vaccine, hoping it'll help us uh, get back to normal uh, sooner rather than later. The good news is that worldwide, there are over 160 vaccine candidates that are being uh, developed right now, and over 30 are in human trials. And uh, hopefully a vaccine will be proven to be safe and effective in the fairly near future, and we can, uh, we can move forward. Well, I think we need to step back and, and ask ourselves, well, well, how do pandemics end? So I, I did a little research. Uh, and there are two, two ways. One is herd immunity, which I think everybody has heard about. Um, herd immunity is when a large proportion of the population is immune to an infection, either after recovering from a natural infection or from vaccine. When people have antibodies, then it makes the spread of infection from one person to another person unlikely. Experts estimate that probably 60 to 70 percent of the population needs to be immune for herd immunity to be effective for uh, COVID-19. Um, recently, the CDC estimated that something like 9% of the population in the United States is immune to COVID-19 from, from prior infection. But we have to remember that Oregon has had less infection than many states. So the immunity in Oregonians is likely to be much less than 9%. But in any event, we've got a long way to go and it seems like we're gonna need a vaccine to help us um, achieve herd, herd immunity. There is some talk about letting the infection just spread among healthy people and get us to herd immunity quicker, but that's highly controversial. There's concern that it would result in a lot of illness and, and a lot more death. But it's important to understand herd immunity. The second way pandemics end is called social. And this, this is kind of interesting, it's when Fear of the virus wanes and society decision makers just say, we want to get on with our normal lives. We're just going to accept the illness and death and we're just going to move on. So deciding the pandemic is over, it doesn't really mean it's over, but people just get back to normal, which so sounds a little funny, but we have to remember um, or be aware of the fact that since 2010, between 12,000 and 61,000 Americans have died from the flu every year. And we have not taken this drastic measures that we've done for COVID-19. Um, year to date, nearly, 20, near, nearly 2,200 people have died from COVID-19 already and the year isn't over. So clearly it's more lethal than the flu, but just, just something to think about. In any event, we're hoping the vaccine is kind of our get out of jail card, but when we dig a little deeper, there are a lot of issues which make us think that it may not be as rosy a picture as we, as we would hope. And I've um, come across a, a, a six, six areas that we need to really think about when we think about how our vaccine's gonna work. 
The first is that once a vaccine is um, approved by the FDA, it's felt to be safe and effective, it will take many months to manufacture and distribute vaccine to offer it to 331 million people in the United States. It's not gonna happen overnight. The other thing is that some of these vaccines will require two or three doses, which means we will have to have two to three times the amount of vaccine. I mean, we're talking millions and millions and millions of doses. So it's gonna take a while. Another issue is that most vaccines need to be refrigerated, but some of the vaccines that are being studied need to be maintained at ultra low temperatures, minus 112 degrees Fahrenheit. Most medical facilities don't have the setup to keep a vaccine at minus 112 degrees Fahrenheit. And this temperature will have to be maintained, you know, throughout transportation and distribution all along the supply chain. So that would be another, another challenge that might, might delay the rollout of vaccination. Something else we need to keep in mind is that worldwide there's lots of vaccine candidates. And if the best vaccine is made from a country outside the United States, I can assure you they're not going to send their first 331 million doses to the US. There will be delays if it's uh, a vaccine in another country. So something we need to keep in mind. A big issue is that experts say that any vaccine to COVID-19 will not be perfect. It will not provide 100% immunity. The bar that the FDA has set for approving a vaccine is that it has to show efficacy of at least 50%. So this can mean a couple of things. This can mean that um, among the vaccinated population, you have a 50% or more greater chance of not becoming infected. It can also mean that after vaccine, if a person does get infected, it's 50% or more or less severe. In other words, um, a person would have a minor illness be treated at home rather than being in the hospital and on a ventilator. Although we all hope that efficacy would be well greater than 50%, 50% is still a win. It's still a good thing. Um, given that though, if it's not perfect, it could be that we're advised to adhere to some form of masking, social distancing, other measures, even after vaccine is widespread, depending on how efficacious it is. Another big issue is that in recent polls in uh, the last few months, we're told that between a quarter and a half of Americans say they would refuse to be vaccinated. So if we're gonna, if we're gonna aim to have 60 to 70% of the population vaccinated and lots and lots of people refuse to be vaccinated, that's definitely gonna be a barrier to achieving widespread immunity. Um, the last issue I wanna bring up is that the length of immunity um, to COVID-19 is totally unknown. With other coronaviruses, immunity lasts for less than a year. Some coronaviruses, it can be up to two or three years. We just don't know. But it, experts say it will not be lifelong. And that means vaccine will have to be you know, repeated periodically. And of course, that will be another challenge to maintaining immunity in the population. So when will we be back to, to some sort of normalcy? Nobody knows for sure, but I've heard a number of experts predict it will probably be the end of 2021, possibly 2022. Um, it's it's going to be a while. So at this point, I think it's important for all of us to acknowledge the reality of the situation, acknowledge the unknowns. We're likely going to be in this pandemic for a number of months still. It's stressful, it's frustrating, it's isolating, it's difficult, and we will get through this. This will not be forever, we will get through it. But for now, I think we need to focus on what we can do to optimize support of ourselves and each other. Um, this pandemic is providing us with opportunities to be creative so we can um, you know, find new ways to uh, help each other and promote wellness for everyone. And if there are questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I know Melanie has some further discussion on how we can be healthy. Yeah, let's check in first if there are questions. <clears throat> and any, any, yeah, go ahead. Oh. Uh, Terry, you're muted yet. With the flu shot, can you hear me now? I'm, I'm yes. talking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, we, we took our flu shots, I guess. How, how do you feel the flu shots tie to the, to the, to the mm. mix of this? Because I think that's a critical element in my mind, at least for me, that it was. Yeah, no, flu shots are super important. Thousands of Americans die of the flu every year. And we're coming into fall and winter months where, where the healthcare system is going to be dealing with COVID plus the flu. They could happen separately. They could happen together. Um, being vaccinated for the flu will not protect you against COVID, but it will protect you against the flu, which is another deadly illness. So definitely get your flu vaccines. And um, I'm happy that you did that. <laughs> Um, what about the pneumonia shot? How does that tie in? Yeah, pneumonia shot is totally different. If you're in a category that should get pneumonia, do that. I mean, you can get pneumonia, flu, COVID separately together. Um, it just complicates things. So it's best to protect yourself from any vaccine preventable disease, especially during this time. The questions? This is such great information. I know Stephanie has it written up, so we'll probably also post a copy of it um, to be accessible to people. In, in the uh, church, it was interesting, one of the very first um, articles that Bishop Lori shared with all the pastors was, was um, asking kind of, you know, at first we all felt like, well, you know, we're in this, it's like a, like a big bad storm, you know, we're gonna, it begins, it gets bad, and then it stops, and it goes away, and you go back to normal, <laughs> and people were feeling like, that's probably what this is like, and then it went a little longer, and then it's like, you know, this is more like a season, like it's a winter, we're in winter, and it's a really bad, deep winter, and, but it begins, and it has a middle, and it ends, <laughs> and then we realize, that's not really what's going on here either. And talking not just about the, uh, the actual illness, but the societal changes that we're dealing with and the societal um, pressures and crises that we're moving through, we may be in a, uh, what they call it, um, uh, uh, I should have had the word in, in my mind, um, something bigger. <laughs> so it's not just a season, but it's like a whole, uh, change of our universe, you might say, um, an ice age. That's what it was. They compared it to like an ice age where it like dramatically changed the landscape of everything. And for the church, I mean, just talking about the church, we are looking at it as we're going through um, an ice age and we're not going to come out the same as the, at the end as where we entered the whole experience. And we need to kind of take uh, what Stephanie was saying as um, to be mindful of that these are, there are deep and broad changes that we're living through. And so again, like the focus for this forum is how do we do that in some healthy ways? So I thought before Melanie picks up some specifics, I thought um, I'd love to hear the group and we can use the chat. Uh, if you're familiar with the chat box, you can pop that up. Um, you can put your ideas in there, but I'm going to ask you um, what kind of mental health and wellness issues do you feel we're dealing with? How have you seen these issues manifesting? How, how have people you know been suffering? You know, so just you can put it in the chat or you can say it out loud. We're small enough group. We can also say it out loud. I think one of the things that we're dealing with is at uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, we usually have large family celebrations. And this year, we're just really going to ratchet it back. So it's just basically Stephanie and I, because of the potential of coming into an enclosure, into a house where people are more susceptible to trading off the uh, different viruses. So, and that's a change. It's just that social isolation of, of family and even with friends. We're talking about getting to um, going into quarantine for like two weeks prior to Thanksgiving and then getting together and then going back out again in quarantine. And I don't know what that looks like. Is that um, 
a safe thing to do or just not? Uh, maybe Stephanie could speak to that or Carrie. Yeah, I mean, quarantining for two weeks before, I mean, sounds reasonable. I, I don't, I've never heard of that as an official recommendation and strictly quarantining is really hard. So are you not going to go to the grocery store? You're not going to be face to face with other human beings? Is the entire group going to adhere to that for the whole 14 days? Um, that That's a heavy lift, mm -hmm. um, but it sounds reasonable. Yeah, well, we've been talking about it, and so including some of the kids. So we just have to come together and say, okay, this is what we can do, and is this a good idea, or you know, how comfortable do we feel? So, yeah, that will be interesting to see what we how we deal with that. You know, one of the things that that we run into too is people are talking about not getting their uh, vaccinations, and, and there's just this. I don't know if it's a conspiracy or there's this fear out there that the vaccinations cause more harm, but you know, in the research that went back when this whole thing started was a physician in Great Britain who wasn't even really dealing with total populations. He looked at nine different cases and he built his whole theory of vaccinations cause harm and autism on that. And he's been debunked and lost his license, mm -hmm. but this is prevalent out there. In my career, I have never seen an adverse effect to a, a vaccine that's caused bodily harm. So mm. I would encourage you guys, if you haven't got your flu shots to get it, because one of the worst case scenarios you could run into is contracting the flu and, and the COVID virus at the same time. And how is that gonna be treated if you're hospitalized? I mean, yeah. you, and when I'm in the hospital, we've had people during just a, the H1N1 vaccine, we filled the hospital up with, it, with uh, people who are suffering from the flu. And if you've got both these things going on, it's gonna be a, uh, it's gonna be a mess. So mm -hmm. I encourage you to, to get those flu shots. And some of us, if we haven't gotten our Pneumovax yet because of our age, get those too. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting to me as a pastor that that vaccine issue has, has bled into some spiritual issues and social issues because I've, I've literally had somebody say to me that the vaccine, you know, and okay, uh, their fears about vaccines are, were already there before COVID vaccine, but with the COVID vaccine, there's actually a belief or a thought there that they're going to put a a tracking, a micro tracking type thing in that, and that, that this is going to be the mark of the beast from Revelation. I mean, literally, this is going around in some circles. And I grant you, I agree, it's probably a very small amount, but it's enough of the population that um, it's building on not just physical fears, what a vaccine might do to my children or my family or me, but emotional and spiritual fears it's just like to me that i you know the layering of fear so many fears that are being stirred in people's lives and some of it through social media like you said through old you can access these old um uh, uh kind of papers that have and you don't see the debunking part of it, it it's just very unusual it's it feels like Pastor Donna, one of the things, you know, this computer chip comes from that QAnon group, yeah. but as a, as, a, as a healthcare person and knowing Stephanie and myself who have vaccinated people, in God's name, we would never inject a computer chip into anybody. And, yeah. I, and I think that needs to be yelled out loudly. We would absolutely, I, yeah, ethical on our part to do that. We would absolutely. never do that. I, I totally, I, I get that. Yeah, I see a hand over there. But don't you think that some people even before the pandemic were really on the edge emotionally and mentally yeah. and maybe they didn't even know it. And then they have been more susceptible to believing this type of thing. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm thinking about one person in particular that is pretty out there and, and and you wouldn't believe you know kind of how far it's gone for this person until now but and and i just look at it like 
you want to pull away from that person. But on the other hand, I think that they just need a little closer communication so that they can tend to whatever was going on even before all of this, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that totally makes sense. Yeah. 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 Well, it's interesting. They call it vaccine hesitancy. It has been much stronger in Oregon and the Northwest and other parts of the country for many, 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 many years. The FDA is aware of this and that vaccine hesitancy will be a huge barrier to us getting through this pandemic. And they're committed to being transparent with their data, with the safety, you know, really trying to reassure people. And um, some, some experts think that once a vaccine is rolled out and people see it safe and effective, that some of these hesitant people may change their minds. But the other thing I have to throw out, you know, I'm, I'm an old physician. I have seen <laughs> terrible uh, disability related to diseases that are now prevented by vaccine. Because in the early days of my career, I, I've seen people with post polio syndrome who were, you know, had disability. I have seen people who have lifelong disability from rubella during pregnancy. And these things are prevented. Younger people, they've never seen this stuff. So these vaccine yeah. preventable illnesses, it means nothing because they've never seen it because we've done such a good job and it makes me crazy. Yeah. Well, hearing those stories I think are important too. I mean, my mom was a nurse, you know, she's 90 years old. So she, she tells us those stories of what it was when she had to deal with the people recovered from 1918 flu. She yeah. talks about all those things and it does help your perspective at least to know that that's why all this stuff came from. That's right. Right. These are terrible illnesses. They're preventable. But younger people, they've never seen it. They have no idea what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, I grew up with an uh, older brother who was um, born under the effects of chickenpox mm -hmm. in utero. And he was severely mentally challenged, but also, you know, I, I know it's an old term, but severely retarded. And, and Dennis, I mean, it was sad to watch that as a kid growing up with that. So as Stephanie said, and, and it's, it's true, we see these things, but the younger peers uh, don't see them at all. Thank you guys for that. That, yeah, that conversation on vaccine is so important. Well, one of the uh, groups at our church that um, meets on a regular basis for support, for uh, supporting one another's health and a group that knows about how to, you know, how people have to cope sometimes with many layers of, of crisis all at one time that affects their whole family, their whole being, their whole system um, is the breast cancer survivor group, support group. And um, I was so glad Melanie could join us. Uh, she's hosted that group for um, uh, quite a few years now. And um, so I'm going to invite her to share a little bit and then we can have a conversation with her too. Okay, thank you. Thanks for um, everybody being here. I was watching the um, service this morning and I want to start with the, the pastor that spoke. She was amazing. And that, that God dwells in the darkness. And I think that's the, the core of this whole thing. There's so many people are in this dark space right now. Like Gail, you said they were already on the edge and now they're just in this hole. But that we can all remember that God is here with us and he's not going anywhere or she's not going anywhere. God's not going anywhere. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, thank you, Donna, for that intro. It, it you, you took away my opening, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, you can when, add anything you want to it. <laughs> <laughs> When you have a, a, a chronic illness, and that's what cancer is, it's not an acute, it doesn't just come and then go away. There are many layers to that. And I feel like with the COVID piece, it, it, I, was, I met with our group a couple of weeks ago on the church grounds on the labyrinth, we all were outside and everything. But one of the, um, the members, she said, you know, this is like being in isolation from being on chemo your blood cell counts are way down, you can't be around anybody, um, you have all these mental things, emotional things that are going on, and so that, I was like, yeah, you're right, I mean, in one, in one, in, um, in one aspect, this COVID thing has helped some people just settle into themselves, 
and figure out who they are. And I think that's a good mental health thing to do is not be afraid to have, <laughs> to have conversations with yourself and check in with yourself. How am I doing today? What can I do that'll make me feel better? Or what is gonna bring me joy today? So don't be afraid to check in with yourself a lot with, with that. Um, do I need help? And asking for help is a sign of strength. It's not a sign of weakness. Getting help for mental illness is a sign of strength. Um, you're strong enough to go ahead and ask for that help. help. There's also with um, any kind of chronic thing, which is what this COVID thing is, like Stephanie, you said, who knows when it's really going to go away. So it's not an acute situation. It's chronic. Your life takes on a different type of um, reality. Um, and I won't call it a new normal because we all right now are having a new normal every day, almost every minute. Like, we don't know when this is going to end. And I think that's where a lot of the fear is coming from. I think as humans, we like to have control and we just don't know what's going to come tomorrow or the next day or, or whatever. Um, to again, be able to sit back and say, I'm not in control. God's in control. And that practically to make that work is very difficult. I have a really hard time with that. I got to tell you, you know, I, 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 yeah, I guess I can be a control freak, but, but to sit back and say, okay, God, you've got my health, you've got my family, but also to use my own education and my own brain to do what I, what needs to be done. Um, I have a girlfriend that with the COVID stuff, she's like, well, it must be the end times. And I'm so sorry, I haven't been able to go to the apocalypse group study because I wanted to do that so badly. This must be the end times, you know, but then she had, um, her daughter was just diagnosed with lymphoma and that this end times thing just got flipped on its head. So now she's taking an active part. So uh, again, taking an active part in others' lives and your lives is a good um, mental health uh, strategy. There's also that, I don't know if you've heard the COVID schizophrenia, like, oh, I think I'm gonna go to the store. Wait, I can't go to the store, you know? Oh, everything's fine. And you wake up in the morning, you go, no, wait, everything's not fine. You know, <laughs> it's this flip flop, flip flop, flip flop. And it's exhausting. So to take care of yourself, to exercise, we're all in the breast cancer group, really strong believers in regular exercise, get out and walk, do your yoga. Um, and if you're walking it every day, it really, really does help. And if you're out in nature, that's one of the best things you can do for your mental health. I am such a big believer in getting out there and getting in the trees or getting by the ocean. Um, because it grounds you. So ground yourself in what God has given us. And, and if you can get out there, just walk around the block. If you have the ability to get out 30 minutes and, and walk along the river, that's even better. But get yourself out there and get yourself grounded. Your feet are touching the ground. That's a really, really good mental health um, strategy. Um, and like I said before, get to know your own mind check in with yourself as much as you can even check in with your family how do you think i'm doing today just to, you know take a take a temperature on what's going on with you don't try and push it down journal journaling is really good um and also helping other people we're kind of isolated where we can't go and hug somebody else but we can send cards we can call people I know in the age of texting, it's so much easier to text, but to hear that voice is amazing. My, my job that I work at, I do a lot of computer work and it just, it's, it's like, ugh. but when I get to call a client and hear their voice, it's amazing that human connection because I can't get out there and, you know, I'll see my neighbors from across the street, but that human connection of that human voice, don't be afraid to call somebody. Don't wait for somebody else to call you, call them. Don't be in that waiting place as Dr. Seuss calls it. Um, a regular routine is also important. Get to bed the same time at night, get up at the same time in the morning, try and keep some kind of routine so you have that familiarity of what your life is looking at when everything else is falling apart. Um, yeah, it's just, and, and support each other. Also music, turn on some music if you're feeling down. Just get the, the old records out, 
listen to some Led Zeppelin if you like Led Zeppelin. Listen to, I don't know, I don't know, I like Led Zeppelin, so <laughs> but listen to um, Johnny Cash. Just turn on some music. That's a really, really good thing to do. Um, laugh. Watch the funny movies. I remember when this started and it was like, what's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. We're, we're blessed enough to have Michael live with us for a year. He just bought a house and he's living in this weekend. Yeah. But anyway, I said, what can we watch that's going to make us laugh? And it's really hard these days to find something that isn't raunchy to, you know, you just want to laugh. So we watched um, Top Gear, the, the original English version. And that just had me laughing every night. It brought me out of myself. Those guys are just so funny and so just there. It's just fun. It's fun. So find a funny movie, um, read a joke book, you know, something that gets you to laugh. And also when all else fails, which we should be doing anyways, is pray. Pray that God, I know you're with me in the darkness. Um, you know, whatever speaks to your heart and how you want to talk to God. And it's okay to be mad at God too. Like, what the heck? I'm trying to do this, but it's not working. What the heck? Can't you help me? What's going on? So be honest with God. And um, let's see. I think just one day at a time. Sometimes it's going to be one minute at a time. Sometimes those feelings are overwhelming. Um, sometimes it's two steps forward, three steps back. But if you keep putting your feet one in front of the other, you're going to go someplace. So uh, just don't forget to reach out to other people if you're feeling sad or, or yeah. So that's my spiel. <laughs> Thank you for just stirring a, a wonderful pot of ideas and opportunities in the midst of the crises that we're living in and through. Um, so let's open it up. Uh, questions you might have for Melanie, um, ideas. I think, you know, to bring your own ideas to the table, let's do some brainstorming um, on building on some of the things that Melanie's uh, talked about. But questions, does anybody have questions for her? Hey, I, uh, go ahead. So I want to say thank you for bringing up the uh, concept of the human voice versus texting, because that's very, very important to hear that, that human connection there on the end of the line. What we've been doing more and more with our kids is using FaceTime and talking to them that way so we can see them also. The other thing I find at this time, too, is that turn off the TV and get away from the news programs because they're it's just, I mean, it overwhelms you. It takes you into that doom and gloom. So, yeah. so thank you for sharing. You've got some great, great aspects there you brought up. Uh, we have a friend that reminds me that says, anytime you read, like you're getting on your phone, you're reading the news about the election or whatever, then open up your Bible and read a verse. So for every, every news story, that you read or see, read a verse out of the Bible. You know, um, I don't know which book you're supposed to read, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that that could actually kind of snowball yeah. on you a little bit. But uh, yeah, there are places you could go. Like you know, a lot of the Psalms actually, you could find a verse pretty quickly that will lift you up or bring you into a moment of worshiping God instead of worshiping you know what we might be finding happening in the news and so forth. That that's kind of a clever way to manage that. I was thinking about uh, Alexa uh, does a nice job of listening to any kind of music that you want. When we take our walk and it'll be um, Louis Armstrong, it'll be John Coltrane and you just play a playlist and they'll play their playlist the whole walk and and uh, just let you reach out and learn some artists that you haven't listened to for a long, long time. And, and it takes you back to when you listen to that artist or when your parents mm -hmm. told you about that artist or <laughs> when their parent, parents told you and and it gets you to open up thinking about other things that you just hadn't thought about so that's beautiful yeah i really like the book of proverbs too yeah. there's a lot of really good short uh, messages there mm -hmm. that's a great idea Melanie, I was interested to hear a little bit more because I guess I, I mean, obviously throughout my ministry, you know, I've been supporting people with um, cancer, living with cancer or uh, being a survivor of cancer and cancer treatment. Um, can you say a little bit more about what 
what people are living with when they have a chronic condition and then with the kinds of treatments, I hadn't even thought about that, where they've had to learn, had to isolate and the dangers that they're living with. Um, well, each type of cancer, each person has a different treatment, even the ones that everybody that has breast cancer in the group, we've all had different types of treatment. But while you're in active um, treatment phase, if it's radiation, that's going to mess with your body it's, and, and, and it's going to make you more tired. If you're on um, chemotherapy, it, I, um, I can just speak to what I'm familiar with, but you're because the, the chemotherapy is, is um, it's not just going after, they're getting so much better at this though. It's not just going after the cancer cells. It, it kills all that stuff. So your white blood cells counts are down. You are immunocompromised. Um, so like when I was in um, chemo and the, um, the patient advocate was talking to me in the very beginning and she said, she said, the worst place you can go is church because everybody wants to hug you all the time, right? And people go to church, it's only for an hour. You go to church when you're sick, right? So, so but I, I, I said, I can't do that. I'll just sit in the back and if somebody comes near me, I'll leave. So it was just fine. But um, so you are extremely immunocompromised. Also, some of the chemos cross the blood brain barrier. So you've heard the term chemo brain. Um, and that, that can be a chronic condition too. Um, I know that there's a few in the group, myself included, that have experienced that chemo brain and the, my brain is just not the same as it was. It, I mean, it could be just because of my phase in life, but uh, it, it doesn't just affect, you know, from here down, it, it gets in your head and so it can cause depression and all that kind of stuff. Um, it is, uh, and there's also a lot of fear so the COVID thing can bring up that post-traumatic thing for a cancer or somebody with a chronic condition um, patient because you go back to that isolation and here we are in isolation again and then I can't go out and see anybody and I couldn't see anybody then, I had to be really careful. So it, 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 can, it can escalate that way. That's, you know, we've got lots and lots of people that are immunocompromised from like lupus or Crohn's or celiac disease or rheumatoid arthritis, that that is for me, that's one of the main, not one of the main, I mean, I, I've, I've got a scientific background, but a science background because I taught science, I'm not an expert like Stephanie and Carrie, but I've got some piece of that where you wear your mask, you wear your mask for yourself, but mainly I wear my mask when I do go out for the other people that you don't know. Like after chemo, somebody's hair is growing back. So they say, oh, you're feeling great. Well, you're not, you know, just because you look like you've got hair and you look normal, your body is still healing. And it takes a long, long time to get out of that treatment phase. So I don't know if that's the question you were asking, did that help? No, that, yeah, that definitely helps me understand both better what my, you know, what people I know with, um, you know, cancer, different kind of cancer treatments or situations they're going through. But I heard a lot of layering with like what we're experiencing as a community too. So I, that was helpful. Thank you. So I'm wondering, could we go around the circle or what, we're not a circle exactly, but <laughs> around the screen uh, and maybe everybody share like one or two things that are helping you survive and maybe even thrive in this time. Um, and I'll, I'll start and then I'll invite somebody. Um, I was thinking, you know, um, I really, I don't take walks as often as I need to. And that has made me realize how much I need to go walking. <laughs> um, that whole taking time to breathe on a, you know, uh, a regular <laughs> breathe in an exercise kind of way and to, um, uh, just give my brain time to kind of process stuff. I do, I realize I did a lot, a lot of processing when I was walking the dog and not having my dog. I don't get that on a insistent, like everyday basis. <laughs> I don't have that little animal there saying, I got to go out for a walk. So I have to walk myself and I just have to get out and do that. Um, but that, that's been uh, one thing that I um, try to do and I know makes a difference for me. 
And the one thing indoors that I find um, helps me um, and I like to do is just spend time with images. And I have a couple different way that I, ways that I do that. One is a, actually a journaling type process called Soul Collage, which I have introduced. Um, I introduced uh, right before shutdown in March, we were doing some Soul Collage um, uh, praying activities. And uh, that works with just images, very simple process but kind of gets you out of, gets me out of my head into a different, you know, kind of part. And then I like, you know, just spending time with photographs, um, either creating a book or just sorting my photographs out, um, you know, and some, I don't know, I just enjoy that. And it kind of relaxes me and, and gets me in a different, a, a different part of my brain. So I'd like to invite um, uh, June to share something that's helping you in this time. There we go. Okay. Um, well, in the beginning, I was quilting a lot. <laughs> I have 41 quilts here to go to church. And um, watch, I feel like I need to get back to that. And But then, you know, it's interesting because I started to make some masks and I had a mental block against it. Like, I just felt like I can't do this right. And, and so it kind of stands in your way. You know, I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm like the rest of my family with the ADD stuff, you know, just there's this block. But, um, you know, I notice I've not been a person that lets things get you down. And, and I notice that my kids are more so like that. And so it's kind of interesting because things that, that you can maintain at your own level, other people can't. And so I feel like there's, there's people that, you know, and, and Tom and I, you know, we're in a retired situation. We didn't have to make the choice to go back to work. We didn't, you know, we can just quarantine. You know, the biggest part for us is our grandkids, you know, and as Stephanie and Carrie described the quarantining process, um, we take that seriously and, and that's pretty much the way we saw it. So our kids are quarantining to be with us and they're supposed to be quarantined by the 20th. And, and, and I know it's a hard call on the little ones and stuff, but then yesterday we see pictures on Facebook, they're at the pumpkin patch. And it's like, that's not quarantining, but, but, uh, well, oh, well, I guess, I don't, I don't know, you know, so, so, but they felt like they didn't see people there, so they were okay, but, so I'm hoping they're all good, because they're, they're moving in on <laughs> the end of this week on Thursday, so we'll, we'll see how that goes, but, but, you know, it's just challenging to know what's really right, and what's not okay, you know, I would love to, like you said, use the church property and maybe get together with some of the quilters or something. I mean, I've noticed people haven't even been in touch as a group. I have a, a bunco group and nobody's been in touch for months and months, you know, just that's kind of sad. But yeah, but personally, you know, I'm doing okay, you know, just and especially our, our biggest thing right now is the Canada stuff and the daily calls and how poorly they're going and the lawyers, the lawyer bills are just piling up and we need to get through this. We need to, you know, we have a trial on the 16th and trial is supposed to go for 18 days. I, I we can't even imagine. Yeah. Um, but we'll pray you through that the best we can, June. And, yeah, and you know, big. we have felt, I mean, through this whole thing, you know, we, we've had our ups and downs and we feel the prayers, we feel the support. Yeah. I, I've never felt alone in this because, good. And, and for the period of time that we've gone through this, I mean, we're talking two and a half years now, going on three years, it started in December. And, and we have had the support of this church community and that's unbelievable I mean, that is a long time to support somebody in this nonsense when it's not affecting you personally you know just 
we, I, I can't say enough about how blessed I feel being here and, yeah. and having that support. Thank you, June. Could you uh, go ahead and invite someone? Um, yes, La I invite um, Terry and Gail. Hmm. Well, we've done a few different things, um, things a little differently from the beginning until now. At, at the start, we were, I was sewing a lot of face masks. He's, he's still working from home. Um, and of course, I, I retired from my job working with children. Uh, so the sewing kind of took place and I had a goal for every day and, and uh, got them to my doctor who had requested them. We were doing cookies at three o'clock, one big cookie, <laughs> heating up that oven every single day just for one. So we didn't have it around. But uh, I think I, I, and we always go for our walks. Um, but right now, what I find myself doing a lot is being on the phone, which I've always loved talking on the phone anyway, so that's okay. But it's finding something to do while you talk on the phone to people who are really need to talk a lot you know, like my mother or my sister. And, and so it, you have to kind of be able to endure the repetition <laughs> with an older person because they tell you the same story, you know, each time. But they, like my mom talked for an hour. So what can you do while that story is going on? So laundry and dusting gets done, you know, while you talk with your headphones. Um, and the little ones too, a lot of times they will want to talk, yet not really talk anymore, but they want it on. So like Eva will call and just want somebody to talk to her while she colors her picture. And it's like, and then she'll kind of ignore you and, and she gets in trouble with her parents. I said, it's, it's not a matter of conversation. It's a matter of a presence. So you kind of have to put up or change your mind about what a phone call or FaceTime would be. It's just a presence for some people. The other thing for, for me, Gail um, had got me for Valentine's Day a Fitbit. And we got this Fitbit and um, you know, I'd had that hip surgery last year and it just made me get up and walk every hour. And so every hour I'm getting my, you know, a minimum of 250, 300 steps in every hour. And taking our walk, you know, we've got to the point where I'm working 40 miles a week, you know, getting out there and being able to walk. And that, that's amazing. The other thing that has been our grounding point besides the grandkids is our yard. Um, actually doing physical tasks of cutting flowers and, and making the yard look pretty for our own salvation, I guess. Um, peace of mind is to be able to see God's nature because it brings in the birds and the bees. We got bunny rabbits, we got squirrels that, you know, because it's all here, they, they come around and they give you something to giggle at, I guess, you know, watching the stuff that they do. So uh, that, that would kind of be where we were going. Um, if you want to invite. Ah, Maureen. Oh, I was, I wrote a couple notes as each of you were speaking. Um, this summer, I've never, like June, I, I don't let it get me down. There are a lot of things that could get us down, um, but I keep busy. And I, I, I wrote a lot of W things. Um, writing is something that I've done a lot of. I started writing um, and I left it at the lake. Unfortunately, I guess I'll have to start over. I started writing about when I wake up in the morning at the lake because every morning it's a little bit different. The sun comes through. We have two windows in the room that we sleep in. Um, and I can hear the flagpole if it's a breezy day with the clinking of the chain on the pole. Um, and then if it's a breezy day, I see the flag billowing and, and, and maybe standing erect. Um, and I hear the Canadian geese and I, I being a Canadian, that kind of makes me think that's a little bit of me and I'm closer to the Canadian border. So I did a lot of writing about what I saw there. Um, working, I love to work. I like to be busy. I feel like my life uh, isn't complete if I'm not doing something, whether it be yard work or it's usually physical outside things that I really like to do, but it could be polishing a car or something. I have to work. Walking, um, we have a, our lake cabin is a 12 miles around a lake 
and then it's a half a mile to from the mailbox to our house so it's a half a mile out and half a mile back so i can get an hour uh, a mile in going out to the mailbox and back so if i do that twice a day that's good so that's my third w writing working walking and then watching um while we couldn't get together with people there are 17 cabins there so i was able to see people working that doing what they were doing or playing children on the beach uh, which was very helpful for me to see other people's children <laughs> they're not my children but um, i really love kids and i i think it almost made covid not real when we were there my daughter jennifer was there for five weeks and she said mom it's kind of like covid doesn't exist when we're here at the lake so i think i was i'm very selfish i had a very good summer i missed all of you but I, I kept very, very busy. Um, nature in the yard uh, is really important. Um, and I got back here and saw how my backyard fence needed lots of work. Um, the bark and the grass and James mowed and I trimmed and I don't know, I'll only do that for two days and then I'm off again. It'll look like heck when I get back again, I'm sure. But, so I guess the W's, nature, um, you know, that's helped me this summer um, and communicating with people. I've, I've called Pat Gettle and I've, um, called a number of older people that I know really well uh, that it's harder for them because many of them are at assisted livings and they can't get out. They can't even go to their uh, dining hall, which almost makes it like a prison that they get their food at their door and they're by themselves and most of them don't have social media. So I think it's important to call Pat and all the people who are, are at home um, and, and you feel better. I feel better. So um, I, I do have a little bit of depression in that my, my kids have had some depression um, and my homeless son Thomas has had a very difficult summer. Um, it's pretty hard to be homeless and not have a place to shower or a place to go to a library to connect with the um, internet or to go to a bank to get your debit card replaced that you've had stolen seven or eight times during the summer. So that is depressing for me because I can't help him and now I can't be around him. Um, and it, it, so it's, I feel for him, you know, it's, it's not easy. I think I've become more empathetic to homeless people. Uh, not that I wasn't before, but to see how difficult it is um, to survive and not have a place. And, and I think I can't hear people say bad things about, oh, the homeless people, here goes another tent and here goes, where are they gonna go? Where are people gonna go? You understand there are no services and in COVID in a pandemic, we have no funding for things like that. Um, I've been over the years, very supportive of the father's heart and um, bless them and all the people that, that do that. So, um, and and little, a little window on how different every state is because uh, living here, I think we pretty much get it uh, on the masking and being safe. Um, being up in North Idaho, it's the anti-masking anti rebels is the way I, what I call them. Uh, literally some have guns in their car because they aren't gonna have people tell them to wear a mask. So you really don't go anywhere. Um, uh, there were stores that we used to shop at for years and patronize and the meat man didn't have a mask on, the produce man didn't have a mask, the produce people had masks, but they had them under their chin, like we're wearing a mask, but they're not wearing it right. So um, I really couldn't go there. I told them, I said, I really can't. This is in June. I said, I really have shopped here for 45 years and I really can't come in anymore during this pandemic. And, and they said, well, we have lights over the meat, you know, that kills anything. So that, so it's a little bit different in, in each state is different. Um, I've seen that. Um, so I think we have to understand that, you know, we think about Oregon because we're here um, and then June leaving for Canada. I mean, June and I <laughs> are going into uncharted territory, yeah. <laughs> getting on airplanes, you know, and, and, yeah. and too. so it's, it's a little different. Uh, we, we're very careful. I have more hand sanitizer. I've made masks all summer. I took my sewing yeah. machine made probably six dozen. My nieces and nephews are all in food service. They work at Starbucks and Costco and one's a gymnast and she has students, one student an hour and she has to disinfect all the mats and the bars in Minnesota. So some states get it and some don't. Yeah. Um, so Thank I think you. it's just new territory. Yeah. I invite. Um, Those are great insights. Thank you for lots of levels. Go ahead, Maureen. I invite Lynn.
Thank you. Um, so um, I've been doing a lot of walking. Um, Skids and I will go to the church parking lot at the bottom and he just runs like the devil. And he minds me so I don't have to any leash or anything. So that's fun. I walk the labyrinth and um, then Gary and Jan and I meet um, after work. So I'm still working from home. Um, I love my Zooms uh, with the church meetings and, and service and coffee house and seeing all of you guys. I miss you guys so much. And I've been kind of getting into um, crafts. So I've got this diamond, this uh, painting diamond um, project going on. So I've got, I'm, you should see my table here. It's over, I cannot stop ordering them. So um, that's been kind of fun. But um, so there's gift cards and things like that. So I'm kind of getting ready for maybe um, Christmas. Um, for people. So, um, I have my downtimes and I try not to let myself get too settled into that. And so, you're right about the TV. You need to turn the TV off and get out, out of the news, which I do too much of, and music. Um, I need to do that more. And um, I'm not really good with calling people, I'm just usually texting. So, I need to. Uh, concentrate because there's quite a few people who I really need to touch, you know, reach out to. So um, I just appreciate all of you guys just getting, being together like this and be able to share the church service and coffee house and different classes that we're doing and godly play. We're starting to pick up that again. So mm -hmm. that's about what I've been up to. Thanks, Lynn. Welcome. Melanie, I'm going to invite Melanie. Thank you, Lynn. Um, yeah, I think I, I shared what I do. To, the more I get outside, the better I am. And working in the yard is amazing. Um, I, this summer, because Craig's been working out of town, so I've been doing a lot more of the yard work, and we had um, 12 yards of bark not mulch but bark chips dumped when they cut some trees and I moved nine of them <laughs> I was like but I did drop the wheelbarrow on my foot one day so that took me to the doctor didn't break anything but yeah just getting out there and that physical that physical movement is great so yeah and listening to the birds and looking for that stuff so yeah I invite Diane There, I was trying, I couldn't get the unmute to work on my little phone. I think uh, everybody's been saying things that we've done. I think this move has been so challenging, um, but in some ways it's been good at our house. I got lazy because the kids had moved on. I wasn't walking with the grandkids or taking care of them. And so with the dog, I would just kind of let him out the front door and then come, I wouldn't walk with him like I had before, but here in the, um, townhouse complex uh, there's no yard so I have to take them out for a walk and I think it's really beautiful around this area so I'm really enjoying that um, I've noticed short walks but still it's getting me out and then we haven't had internet for a week um, since we moved here and so we're not getting the news regularly or um, so it's been challenging for Anna because she has zoom classes with uh, ex exceed her adult uh, care center and um, our community center, I should say. But we've gotten hotspot on our phones that work kind of and, um, but that's been helpful. And I think, and I think really for us, the, for me personally, the church, regular church services has really helped that kind of that routine that you talked about, Melanie, keeping in a routine. Somehow that Sunday morning church service has helped with my routine. So uh, I don't know if I haven't really found I haven't gotten into a rhythm because when COVID first hit, or we first realized about COVID, our, we were living in the house with our son and daughter-in-law and two grandkids and they all got sick. And, and they, we had to stay downstairs that whole time we, because we didn't, you know, we were like quarantined from them or they were quarantined from us. And then after they got better, we became full-time caregivers for the grandkids, which 
in one way was great, but another way was very, very exhausting day after day after day with two little kids. And then they hired a, a caregiver to come into the house. So we kind of got out of that routine and then they moved out. So we, you know, that was chaos and trying to clean and, and get them moved out. And then now we moved out and we still have a lot of work to do over this. So I guess what I'm saying is it's just been exhausting, chaotic life this these last since about March and um, in some ways maybe that's kind of good because it gets your mind off other things but uh, it's also been really difficult so I'm looking forward now with our new place and and once we get everything get the house cleaned out and on the market that'll be a relief and then just kind of getting into a, a rhythm so that's that's our story <laughs> I'll invite somebody else. Let's see. Who hasn't gone yet? I think it's just the Broadhursts. If okay, you want to zoom over Stephanie. to them. Yeah. Okay, Carrie wants me to go first. Um, boy, um, trying to stay busy, I think, is the key. And um, even though I'm retired, I was working very part-time and I got furloughed because of COVID, but I'm very happy that I got rehired back. And so I'm working like one day a week, which is actually perfect. I love healthcare and I'm working at the telephone call center so it's safe and so I'm really enjoying that a lot. Um, Carrie and I walk a lot and we go without masks which is liberating and if there's someone else we go way out around them and it's okay. And then the last thing is I'm taking a Spanish class um, online Zoom through CCC and that's fun. I have my little homework assignments and um, it's keeping me busy. So I'm passing the time and I think I'm doing pretty good under the circumstances. Well, let's see, I'll keep mine short. With Stephanie uh, going back to the call center at least once a week, I can get back on the roof now and do some work. <laughs> so not teasing. Um, and the other, what I do is I do a lot of outdoor activities and I work in the yard a lot. And what I really find spiritual uplifting, I encourage you guys, if you do get down to the church grounds, because when I work down there, it's just a whole different spiritual feeling down there amongst the, the trees and just being close to the church. And the other thing I do that's different than the other, than the rest of you is that I shoot shotgun a lot. I shoot clay. And when I get really frustrated, I go out to the gun range and break a lot of clay. And it just really, I find it really satisfying because you get, when you see the clay break, there's another frustration that goes. So if anybody wants to join me, just let me know. I've got extra shotguns and, and um, ammunition to get you out there. And that's the females too. Come on out. It's fun. There's <laughs> a, a lot we can learn. <laughs> I love that all around the circle, everybody brought something, um, a new thought or a new activity or a new, um, you know, something to each other. And so I hope all of you continue to, to be healthy and to draw from these um, things that we've been talking about, the practices that we have been lifted up. And those of you who are watching this, um, who are not a part of the actual Zoom call, uh, because I'm going to post this where people can um, watch it and participate with us. I encourage you to email us or to share in some way the practices that, that are helping you stay healthy and thrive in this time. So I'm going to close us with a little um, activity. So if you have your arms uh, available to move just a little bit, um, I want us to remember as we go that we um, go with um, that invitation from uh, the scripture from Jesus to um, love God with all our heart, find your heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, and with all our body, <laughs> and to love ourselves with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, and all our body and to love our neighbor with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our body. <laughs> so go in peace, my friends, and peace and wholeness and wellness. Thank you so much. Amen. Bye-bye.